Jai Baba, everybody. Uh, uh, we are going to be reading uh, Surrendering to His Love today. And I welcome everyone who's joined in on Zoom and all those who will be listening in. Jai Baba. So we're going to start reading from page 20. Eva, could you scroll down the page? Yeah, all right. This is page 20, right? Yes. Wonderful. Surrendering to him. To Pilama's room, but by now I was so curious that I kept persisting money, Pila and Naja, to tell me more about Baba. As we were talking, I suddenly became tired of all the chatter and had a great longing to see Baba once more. I walked over to the window and looked out. To my delight, I saw Baba come around the corner of the building, walking toward me. Our eyes met for a second, and I felt great joy in my heart. All too soon, we were told it was time to pack up and leave for Bombay. As we were waiting at the upper Mehrabad gate to board the bus that would take us back to Ahmednagar to catch our train. Baba stood with Mehra at his side and each of us greeted him as we passed by. Sometimes Baba would touch someone. Suddenly I felt again an intense longing, this time for Baba to touch me. And sure enough, as I passed through the gate and nodded to Baba, he gave me a hearty pat on the shoulder and a smile. As the bus moved out, I looked back to see Baba with the woman Mandali waving at us, although I didn't recognize exactly what had happened at the time. In later years, I came to realize that if you call out to Baba from your heart, his response is always there. He had brought rain at my wedding. He had known my desire to see him through the window. He had touched me as we said goodbye. When I returned to Karachi, I found that all my previous anta antagonism toward Baba had flowed out of my system. It was completely gone. I was growing more interested in Baba. And whenever Mummy, Minu, Adi, and I were together, we would talk about him. From time to time, we received news about what was happening in Baba's circle. And I looked forward to hearing about his activities. Sometimes we received circulars saying that Baba wished us to keep silence for a day or fast for a certain period of time. There was, there were these were not orders, but I found myself happily taking part in whatever Baba asked us to do. I was also increasingly aware that whenever I was confused or needed help, I was turning to Baba and silently calling out to him to help me. It wasn't long before I was expecting my first child and I was very happy. Then the doctor told me that there was a good chance I might have a miscarriage. And even if I didn't, I might not be able to carry the baby in full term. It was then that once again, sitting in Karachi, I sent a silent message to Baba. But this time, it was not a challenge. It was a loving plea. I told Baba, I want a child. I need a child. I'm longing for a child. If you give me one, I will dedicate him or her to your service. It was during the final month of pregnant, of my pregnancy that Adi was at last to meet Meher Baba in person for the first time. Baba had sent a circular saying that anyone who wanted to meet him could come to Madras on 3rd April 1947 and have five minutes of his darshan. 
Minu Karas urged Adi to take advantage of this opportunity as he had missed many chances to see Baba in the past. As I was doing well, Adi agreed to go. It seemed ironic that Adi, who had known about Baba since he was a schoolboy and had sent me to be with Baba soon after our marriage, had yet to meet Baba himself. Adi and Minu had quite an adventure, first flying to Bombay and then taking the train all the way to Madras. Arriving a couple of days before Baba, they were able to be at the train station for a first glimpse of him and then accompany him to Saidapet, where he was to stay during the Darshan program. They were also able to spend time with Baba after the Darshan, going with him to the cinema owned by the mayor of Madras. And on the last night that Baba was to be there, Minu and Adi were invited to spend the night in the monthly quarters. They slept there with the men. While Baba slept in a small adjoining room, the following morning, they traveled by train with Baba all the way back to Pune, where he got off. While he continued on to Bombay, so the five minutes that Baba had promised in the circular turned out to be more like a few days. Adi returned to Karachi, very happy indeed. He said that until he met Baba personally, he was making a slow, slow crawl in Baba's next page direction. But after he met Baba, the crawl became a gallop. There was no stopping him. Tina, would you like to read from here? From here, from this battle. To add to our happiness. To add to our happiness. On May 7th, 1947, our first son was born. A healthy, full-term baby. Although I was not thinking of Baba's name at the time of though I was not thinking of Baba's name at the time of the delivery, simultaneously with my son's birth, the name of Baba pulsed through my whole body. It was like a wave that passed from head to foot, vibrant with his name. And when Minu sent Baba a cable telling him of our son's birth, Baba cabled back, my blessings to Rhoda and her son. A few days later, another cable arrived most unexpectedly. This one read, Rodadi, boy may, named to be named Merwan. Blessings, Baba. I had told no other person of this, of my silent dedication to this child, to Baba, nor had I written to him about it. But I do have to say that despite all my love and surrender, I didn't leak the name at all. <laughs> it was then the fashion to give long Persian sounding names to me. And to me, Merwan was a very old fashioned name. However, I was overjoyed. If anyone today, today and today, if anyone told me to change Merwan's name to anything else, I wouldn't do it for anything. It's the most precious name of all. Scroll down. Chapter three. In December, 1948, a few of us from Karachi, Minu, Mami, Adi, Merwan, and I traveled to India. Our Merwan was 19 months old and Baba asked him to bring him to me, asked me to bring him. When we arrived, Baba told Minu to bring Merwan to him. After Baba had held, sorry, 
After Baba held Merwan in his lap, the child was put on the floor. We were then asked to come into the room where Baba was, by which time Merwan was crawling around quite at home. As we were greeting Baba, Merwan suddenly stopped crawling, sat up and looked straight and looking straight at the beloved, shouted, Baba! <laughs> Baba gave him a beautiful smile. And then on the alphabet board, he spelled out his message. Out of the many on the waiting list, I have selected him. I garlanded Baba with a silent, thy will be done. And after we had individually received Baba's, Baba's darshan, we were allowed to remain with him for some time. I felt even more of my original doubt fading away. Scroll down. Two years later, Baba gave Adi and me another son, Homi. One more, then one morning, soon in 1952, soon after Homi was born, I found myself being pushed awake just before dawn. I was half asleep, half awake, but I felt something extraordinarily beautiful was taking place within me. At first, I just lay there in bed, but then I felt an urge to get up. So I walked from our bedroom through my children's room to the veranda where I stood in front of the window and looked out at the sky. An unshakable conviction that Meher Baba was God in human form flooded my being. This conviction was so deep, so strong, so vibrant that I knew with absolute certainty that God, Baba was God the personification of truth and beauty. And without him, life had no meaning. He was the one who comes again and again into the world. As Krishna said, wherever there is a resurgence of evil and injustice in the world, I, the avatar, takes human form for the destruction of evil and the establishment of righteousness. Uh, it had taken several years since my first meeting with Baba for the last of my doubts to evaporate. But from that moment on, my conviction has never been, mo morning on, my conviction has never been shaken. I have loved Baba obeyed him and surrendered to him. I have to leave soon. So I'll just finish up this page. One day, many years later, I was sitting alone when I, and I wondered exactly when it was that I had fully accept, accepted Baba as the avatar. Immediately, I remembered that morning long ago, and instantly, and I instantly recalled one other ep episode concerning my dear father, and how anxious I had been to tell him about my visit to Ahmednagar to see Baba. Someone else can take over now, because I have to leave. I can read. Yes. My dad and I shared a deep love and understanding of one another. Even when I was only a child, I adored him. He was the one to whom I told all of my secrets. Even when I got into trouble at school and had to stand alone outside the classroom, so that everyone would know I was being punished, I would go directly to my dad as soon as I got home. I would sit in his lap and put my arms around him. 
and he would know that I was troubled about something. Now, what have you been up to, he would ask, and I would tell him. Dad was the first person to whom I confessed my love for Adi Dubash. And when I said that if I were to marry, I would marry him, Dad didn't argue. He just said, okay, give me a few days and I'll find out about the boy. Several days later, he called me in and told me he'd made discreet inquiries about my friend Adi and had received wonderful reports. He's a fine man, my father said. Go ahead, I will help you. Naturally, dad was the person I most wanted to talk with about Meher Baba. My opportunity had finally arrived several months after we returned to Karachi after meeting Baba in 1945. I was spending the day with my parents and I waited for an appropriate moment. In the afternoon, my father and I were alone in the dining room and he asked me to make him a cup of tea before he went out. I brought him what I thought was a nice pot of tea. But as I poured him a cup with disapproval, and here's a picture of Adi and Rhoda in Karachi, late 60s. Oh no, oh, not this white tea again. Why have you put so much milk? Dad, I answered innocently. Plain black tea is not very good. You must have milk in it. You don't know. You don't understand how good plain tea is, he answered. But he started sipping. As we sat there together at the table, I said, Dad, I want to tell you something. You know this last time when I went to Bombay with Mommy and Minu, I also went to Ahmed Nagar. I know you believe in saints and satus, and I have met the greatest of them. Dad stopped drinking his tea and looked at me over the top of the cup. In Ahmed Nagar? He didn't ask who, but where? In Ahmed Nagar, I repeated. His face showed great surprise. In Ahmed Nagar is Meher Baba. Yes, Dad, I am talking about Meher Baba. I met him. Dad's cup plunked into the saucer as he stared at me. What? You met Meher Baba? Yes, Dad. And I tell oh. you that all the talk I heard as a schoolgirl at the time of Korshed Pastakia's death was just slander and rumors. What did you find there? What I found at the ashram was pure love, peace, and joy. Dad did not hesitate for even a minute. Have you any books on Meher Baba? He held out his hand as if to take a book from me. Not long after our conversation, Jean Adriel's avatar came out. That was, in fact, the first time I had ever seen the word avatar. I gave it to my father and Manu Karas gave him Baba's discourses. I have always been happy that I had the opportunity to tell my father about Meher Baba mm -hmm. because he had a heart attack soon after our conversation and lived for only another year and a half. In those days, heart patients were confined to their beds. And during that time, he had both Avatar and Baba's discourses on his bedside table. 
he wouldn't allow anyone to take them away. Once my elder sister was with us and asked him to sign a check that she'd written for household expenses, she put the check on the book of Baba's discourses and held it while he signed, then started to take the book away with the check. Come, Dina, put the book here again, Dad called out. And the Baba books were right there next to him when he died the following day. The experience of arriving at absolute certainty that Baba was God in human form left me with a great uplifting sense of wonder and joy. But in the time that followed that morning, I also became quite restless. I had to see my beloved. There was so much I wanted to tell him, but Baba was at this time in the West and no correspondence was allowed. The nearest we had to contact with him in recent years, during which he had been in his new life phase, was a visit for marriage in Pendu, Baba's very close disciples who resided with him during their tour of India and Pakistan in preparation for the period of Baba's fiery free life. I didn't know when I would be able to see him again. Then came the shocking news of Baba's accident in America. Those were anxious days and I waited along with all his other lovers for word on his condition. In August of 1952, an unexpected telegram arrived saying that, that Baba and his party would be stopping for a few hours at the Karachi airport on their way home from the United States. Because of an airline strike, they were forced to make a detour and catch a flight from Karachi to Bombay. The cable address to Minu Karas gave instructions that he should come alone to the airport. But I was convinced that Baba had heard the call of my heart and that was one of the reasons he was stopping in Karachi. I had no doubt that he would send for me and I would finally see my beloved. Sure enough, early on the morning of Baba's arrival, a call came for me and our two boys. Adi was already at the airport as he had been called even earlier in the morning to come assist Baba and the others. I started my journey to the airport to meet him for the first time with the full knowledge that he was the avatar. As I entered the designated room in the airport terminal, there was God Almighty sitting with his leg in a heavy cast, but looking as beautiful and majestic as only God could look. In spite of the discomfort his injuries must have caused him and the long tiring journey he had just made. He saw me and a smile lighted his face. The next moment he was enfolding me in his arms. Then he called Merwan to him. I picked Homi up but Baba gestured, enough. That was the first time that Homie had met Baba. The few hours that I was there with Baba, I was literally swimming in his ocean of love. I felt such buoyancy that I could hardly keep my feet on the ground. With so many people present and so much activity going on around him, there was no opportunity for me to tell Baba all that I wanted to tell him. I knew in my heart that he was already aware of what I wanted to say. But I also knew that in time, 
he would create the opportunity for me to say it. After a little while, Baba asked Adi what his work was. Adi told him that he was connected with shipping. Baba said, can you arrange sea passage for all of us? Then he paused. No, we must go by air this very morning. Get me six seats on today's flight to Bombay. Adi went down to the booking office on the main floor and asked for six seats for Bombay. The clerk told Adi emphatically that the flight was fully booked. No seats were available. When Adi came back and told Baba that no seats were left, Baba said, try once again and tell the clerk to check through his papers very carefully as I must go today. Adi went back down and requested that the clerk check the papers carefully again. To Adi's surprise, he did so and then announced that one seat was available. When Adi reported the news, Baba sent him downstairs once more <laughs> to say that he definitely needed four seats, but two in their party could fly the next day. Adi returned to the booking office. <laughs> By this time, a crowd had gathered. Everyone was asking about seats. Adi waited until the crowd thinned out and then approached the booking clerk again. Once again, this time the man was less patient. I have gone through the passenger lit repeatedly and no more seats are available, but let me see. Reluctantly, he checked. And as he finished looking through the list, to Adi's surprise and joy, he said, I have three seats available. <laughs> Adi ran back to Baba to give him the good news, but it was not good enough. <laughs> Baba told him to go down yet again and ask the clerk for one more seat as four of them had to fly together. This time, when the clerk saw Adi in the office, <laughs> he got angry and rather rude, but Adi stood in the corner meekly waiting for the clerk to finish what he was doing <laughs> before pestering him once again for an additional seat. In sheer disgust, the clerk picked up the passenger list and started going through it very carefully. After a couple of minutes, he told Adi that four seats were available. Adi literally flew up the stairs to give Bob the good news that the mission was accomplished. Baba and three of the Mondali could fly to Bombay on that day's flight. The other two Mondali would leave the following day. Thank you, Eva. Rosie, you Oh, Mia. You were just highlighted for her, no? From where she has to read. Rosalie, are you reading? Uh, yes, I am here. Yeah, can you read from here? We had brought a basket of fruit. Okay, we had brought a basket of fruit for Baba. And he accepted it very lovingly and told Dr. Gohair to put it with their luggage. She protested. 
But Baba, we're already overweight. Silently, I was calling out. Please, Baba, take it. It's from us with all our love. Baba turned to Dr. Gohair and gestured. Just put it with the luggage. We will take it with us. Then it was time for farewell embraces, after which the beloved was once again wheeled to the plane and lifted up the gangway. I need them lowered. All, all in time, Baba was in Pakistan during this layover. He did not put his foot on Pakistani soil. He was either carried or wheeled wherever he went. We watched him waving to us from the plane and we waved back. I blew kisses to him until I could no longer see the plane. And going home, I looked at people on the street going their way as usual. And I wanted to shout to them, telling them, God is here again among us. He was just here in this very town, and I was one of the blessed ones to embrace him. Chapter 4. In August of 1954, Meher Baba was in Satara, and I was visiting Panchgani, a hill station a few miles away with my two sons. On 30th August, Rusi Bilamoria, the cousin whom I was visiting, and another friend from Panchgani were going by car to Satara for some work. I decided I couldn't pass up this opportunity. So I asked my cousin to let me accompany them to Satara and drop me at Grafton Villa, where Baba was staying. As we approached Satara, I was suddenly filled with misgivings. What would Baba say about me dropping in unannounced? What was I thinking of? But then I assured myself that I needed to see Baba and tell him what I had wanted to tell him at the airport in Karachi two years earlier. In any case, it was too late to turn back. As we approached Grafton Villa, I asked Rusi to stop the car a short distance from the gate of the villa. I got out of the car and told Rusi to come back for me in the evening. By that time, I knew something of Baba's ways. And I thought if the car waited for me, he would see me for only a few minutes and then send me packing. But without a car, I would be helpless and Baba would have to take me in. Everything is fair in love and war. I concluded, and when the car was only a tiny speck in the distance, I walked to the gate. Rano Gailey, one of the Mondali, appeared and asked me what I wanted. I've come to see Meher Baba, I said. He doesn't see anyone, answered Rano. That's all right. Just give him a message. Tell him that a lover of his has come from Karachi to dedicate her life at his feet. Rano's hand shot out over the gate and we shook hands. Wait a minute, said Rano. She went into the house. <laughs> a few minutes later, she returned and said, I've given your message to Baba. He is very happy and he wants you to come to Rosewood Cart cottage at two o'clock this afternoon. I was overjoyed. Could you tell me where Rosewood Cottage is? Why? Don't you have anyone to take you there? Asked Rano. I was all innocent. No, I'm sorry, but I'm absolutely alone here. Wait a minute. 
Rana went inside again. I waited, certain that Baba would call me in. But a few minutes later, Dr. Gohair appeared with her bicycle and said, Baba has asked me to take you to Koryar Sitarawala's house and to give him Baba's instructions to bring you to Rosewood Cottage at two o'clock. Well, I thought, you can't say I didn't try. But what could I really have expected? Baba is the avatar and he is always one up on us. Koryar, another follower of Baba's, was overjoyed to see me as this would give him a chance to have Baba's darshan too. Soon we sat down to eat lunch, but I couldn't wait for it to be over. As I was so eager to get started, come on, let's go, I said repeatedly. So Koryar and I set out on foot, trekking through the fields until we reached the main road. Suddenly we saw a car approaching at full speed, honking. Koryar stopped abruptly. It's Baba, he said. That's his car. The car drew up to where we were standing and Eric leaned out the window on the driver's side. He smiled at me. Couldn't you wait until two? He laughed. Well, in any case, Baba has sent his car. He told me it was too hot for you to be out walking. And he said to take the car and bring you. Uh, where does Baba sit in the car? I asked. The front seat, Eris replied. I jumped into the front seat and rode in silence toward Rosewood Cottage, deeply touched by Baba's thoughtfulness and his concern for my welfare. As we drew up at Rosewood, Eric said, go in, Baba is waiting for you. We entered the main room and for a moment I couldn't see Baba as my eyes hadn't adjusted from the bright light outside. And then I saw him sitting in an armchair on one side of the room. Love radiated from his whole being. As I approached him hesitantly, he opened his arms and the next moment I felt his embrace. There are some moments in life when one cannot find adequate words. For me, this was one of those moments. Suffice it to say that time stood still for me in the embrace of my beloved. Love, beauty, and peace flooded me. I had come home. Baba gestured for me to be seated at his feet. He said, your love makes me very happy. Except for the Mandali, I was the only one there with Baba. Using the alphabet board, he inquired about Adi, then spelled out Adi Sunuche. Adi is solid gold. Baba also asked about my older son, Merwan, but I noticed that he didn't mention my younger son, Homie. At one point, Baba said, if I were to ask you to give me your son, would you willingly give him to me? I was so happy interpreting his question to mean that he wanted my son to stay with him as one of the resident Mondali. And spontaneously, I answered, yes, Baba. My answer made him very happy, but I was not to understand the significance of his question for several more months. Then Baba asked, called Bao, one of his mandali to him and asked, do you know her? When Bao answered that he didn't, 
Baba showed surprise and said, how is it that you don't know her? She is the wife of Adi Dubash. Baba then got a very mischievous look on his face. You know, Adi, you know, Adi, that tall, dark, handsome fellow who, near, who nearly drowned Pendu and Erich when they were in Karachi. Baba then asked Erich to tell Bao what had happened. During that visit to Karachi, Adi had taken Erich and Pendu along with me and other Karachi Baba lovers to a boat club where Adi was a member and rowed regularly. Adi was wearing Adi was wearing swimming new page, please. Trunks. But Erich and Pendu were both dressed in normal street attire. And they were carrying all their travel documents with them. In those days, people traveled not with passports, but with travel papers. Thank you, Rosalie. Marvin, can you read from your Adi? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm not muted. <clears throat> Adi, Eric, and Pendu got into the boat and Adi started rowing. At first, everything was all right, but they were a short distance. <clears throat> but when they were a short distance from the dock, water started to leak into their boat. Pendu shouted to Adi. But before any of them could do anything, the water was coming in so fast that the boat started to sink. Then all three of them were in the water. Initially, they all fended for themselves. But Pendu, who was asthmatic, struggled under the weight of his wet clothes and shoes. So Adi turned the rowboat upside down and told Pendu and Erich to cling to it. By this time, all their travel papers had come out of their pocket and were floating in the water. Fortunately, the three were not that far from the dock, and they pushed the overturned boat until they were close enough that bystanders on the shore could come to the rescue. <clears throat> they helped Erich and Pendu, and then picked up all the papers they could find. And when Erich and Pendu sorted through the papers, they were surprised to find that everything was there, soaking wet, but there. Not one paper had been lost or even smudged. The rest of us who had accompanied them waited while Adi drove Erich and Pendu home to change clothes. And then we, next page. And then we continued with our plans for that day. The wonder of it was that a few weeks later when Adi was at the boat club, he inquired whether the boat had been repaired. To his surprise, he was told that no leak was found and in fact, the boat had been in use regularly since the incident. <clears throat> While Erich was telling the story, Baba illustrated it vividly with his gestures, entering into the spirit of the episode. I was fascinated by the simplicity and eloquence of these gestures and the beauty of his expressions as his fingers flew over the alphabet board, and I was overwhelmed with love for him. After some time, Baba said that he and the Mandali were leaving the next day for Ahmednagar to prepare for the Wadia Park meeting and a visit from the Westerners. There were details that needed to be looked after, but he told me I did not have to leave. Just sit over there against the wall and enjoy being in my presence. As Baba went over last minute instructions with the Mandali, at one point he looked at me and said, you are very fortunate to have come today. If you had come a day later, I would not have been here. I sat against the wall thinking. With me, it was always thinking, not words. With Bobby, you don't need words. If something comes from the heart, he hears. At one point, I thought, how beautiful you are. Let me look at you a long time so I could take the image of your beautiful face with me when I go back to Karachi, spontaneously, Baba turned to me 
and started caressing his face with a twinkle in his eye. You know, he said, I have grown old now. My face has lost, lost its youthfulness and is no longer beautiful. Sitting quietly in the room, watching the divine beloved at work, apparently attending to mundane affairs, <clears throat> I was suddenly aware that tears were rolling down my cheeks. I was sitting quite a distance from Baba, and I kept very still so as not to draw his attention to me. But in the midst of his work, Baba again turned to me and with the look filled with compassion said, don't cry now. You will have a lot of weeping to do in the future. I would remember those words later. <clears throat> On the way to Koyar, Satara Wallace house, I had asked Dr. Goher, what does Baba teach us? Late in the afternoon, Bob asked one of the Mandali for the pamphlet, Truth of Religion. Somebody brought it and gave it to Baba, and he handed it to me. Go in the small room and read this. It will help you to understand. However, my concentration was not on the contents, but on the pamphlet itself. At last, I thought, I have something that beloved Baba has given to me personally. Baba, with a twinkle in his eye, gestured. By the way, don't forget to return the pamphlet after you've read it, as it belongs to Bao. Someone showed me to the small room and pointed to a place on the floor where I could sit and read Truth of Religion. I noticed that there was another occupant in that room, Gustaji, one of the Mandali who had been observing silence under Baba's orders for many years. He was sitting cross-legged on the floor patching up his old coat. He nodded to me, his rosy-cheeked face lighting up with a sweet smile. Watching him, I thought, he just needs wings to put on him, and he would be a perfect archangel. Then for some time, I was engrossed in reading the pamphlet. I had just finished when someone came to say that Baba was calling me. In the large room, I saw Koyar and my cousin Rusi, who had come for me, Taking Baba's darshan, I had been given three hours of bliss in Baba's company, but now the time had come to leave. Once again, I was in his all-encompassing embrace, and to ease the pain of separation, the compassionate beloved consoled me, reminding me that I would see him again in only 12 days at the Wadiya Park darshan in Admanagar. Then Baba asked me to bow down to him. As I left, I was walking backwards with my face toward Baba and my back to the door, my way of paying homage to my God, beloved, beloved avatar, Meher Baba. And as I reached the threshold, Baba, ever considerate and loving, gestured, be careful, don't fall over the threshold. <clears throat> Only 12 days after the glorious afternoon, I had spent in Baba's presence in Satara, the Wadiya Park Darshan was held in Abhinagar. When I thought of Baba consoling me with the reminder that I would see him again very soon, my heart was filled with joy as I anticipated being with my beloved once again. Seven of us came together, Adi and I with our two boys, Mami and Minu Karas and his wife Freni. When we arrived, Wadiya Park was already filled with people, a wave of humanity that extended as far as the eye could see. But I was not interested in the crowd. I was already trying to work my way toward Baba to catch his eye and send him a silent message of love. Try as I might, however, I could not catch his attention. Two events that occurred at that darshan stand out in my mind. The first happened soon after we arrived. The darshan was already going on and we milled around waiting until it was our turn to queue up. We were quite thirsty, so someone suggested we go around to the back of the stage behind the dais where Baba was sitting and look for water, maybe, next page, and look for some drinking water. We approached one of the men who was there and he looked around, then said, yes, here is a bucket of water. You can have it. Someone in our group 
commented that the water looked dirty, but he assured us that Ambanaga water always looked like that. And since we were very thirsty, we drank all the water in the bucket. The minute we had finished, another man came running up saying, Baba wants that bucket of water, which he asked us to keep behind the da dais. Where is it? We looked at one another aghast. It seems we had done something wrong. Someone explained to the man that we had just drunk all the water from the bucket. He stared at us, clearly astonished. Okay, he said, I will tell Baba, but this was the water which he had used to wash the feet of the poor. We were dumbstruck, expecting all kinds of difficulties, but nobody said a word to us about it. Nothing happened to us, and nobody even got sick. Second event had to do with my inability to capture Baba's attention on this occasion. As the time came for us to queue up for Baba's darsha, and I thought, now I will surely catch his glance. But as I came closer and closer in the queue, I saw that Baba was busy looking the other way. When it was my turn to bow down to him, I did. I did so, then looked up expectantly. Baba's attention was already on the next person in the queue, and I was just brushed aside. Still, Baba, was... shall we end the reading here? Yeah, sure. We could pick this up next time. All right. Let's stop the recording, Eva. All right. Thank you, everybody. Eugene is here. It's time for us to say bye-bye to everybody and hi to him. <laughs>